And as we continue this series, we actually, Lisa, we're in chapter 5. We're going to be looking at chapter 5. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up the series next week, chapter 6. Uh, and I'm excited about that. Uh, listen, Jesus is amazing. Jesus is amazing. We called this, the, I titled the, this message, A New Way to Be Human. You've heard me over the last three weeks talking about using your humanity as an excuse. Well, let me give you the alternative that, that Jesus has given us in the kingdom. Look at your neighbor and say, there's an alternative. There's an alternative to being human. And we're going to hear about it today. Amen. But let me start off. Anybody remember the book 1984? How many of you had to read 1984 in school? Me too, yeah, I had, I, yeah. There's, there's some that are like begrudging, uh, you know. George Orwell's classic dystopian novel that is very similar to some of the current circumstances that we find ourselves in today. One thing that it brought to us was the concept, for those of you who have read it, of what, what we hear is new speak. New speak. And that's a quotation from the book New Speak. It was a systematic way of changing language by either removing words or reshaping them through redefinition. The truth is, is that in our society, language is constantly changing. How many of you know that? Language is constantly changing. <laughs> Two weeks ago, and I'm going to give you an example of language constantly changing. Two weeks ago, uh, I reached out to give a hug to one of our teenagers. Yes, and they politely shook my hand instead. And I was heartbroken. Why are you not giving me a hug? You have always given, you, you have given me hugs. When I ask for a hug, you give me a hug, you shake my hand. And as they walked away, here's what they said. Handshakes are the new drip. Wait a second. All right, now I know what a handshake means. I know what a handshake is, but what does a handshake have to do with a leaky faucet? <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, you know, when you're like, handshakes are the new drip, that, that's something completely different that's off, my, that's off my radar. I have no idea what that, what that is. So I had to do what most of us in the, now I can admit it, older generation have had to do. I go to Google. Google. And Google takes me to the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> exactly. <And laughs> so, so, in looking at this Urban Dictionary, this website, it takes all of the new speak, and it breaks it down so we in the older generation can understand what they're saying. And then, is it is it not true... That once we realize the word that they're using, what it actually means, we always say, well, why didn't you just say that in the first place? Okay, that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it is uh, uh, for me. And so, as I'm looking it up, this is what it says. At this point, this word drip, without getting into all of the alternative thoughts, and there were plenty, it means simply being cool in your dress and appearance. So for all us older men and women, handshake away because it's the proper thing to do. It's decent. It's respectable. It's cool. And above all, that coolness is a part of our appearance. And it's cool. It's cool, man. Cool. All right? So this is essentially, handshakes are the new cool. Oh. Well, why didn't you say that to begin with? Okay, I, I want to be cool. So if handshake is the new cool, then that's, that's what I'm going to do. But the fact is, is that what they have just explained to us is that this coolness is quite human. It's human. So when we think about this word human, it's another word that, depending upon how you use it, can mean so many different things. In science, the word is used for a classification of species. Regardless of being male or female, human is a classification, right? We know that. 
In society, it takes on the meaning of singularly important and therefore to be valued regardless of race, creed, ethnicity, and all the other classifications that divide more than unite. I mean, we can understand that, right? If I'm going to use the word human in society, what I'm saying is, is I am a person. Respect me. That's, that's, or don't respect me, but, net, but recognize I'm a person. But in spiritual circles, this word takes on the meaning of fallible, imperfect. And if I look even smaller in grace circles, it has become the natural defense for giving in to the temptations of sin. I'm only human. The funny thing is that scripture has something different to say about that. Scripture always has something different to say about that. And Paul here in his letter to the Galatian churches redefines what being human looks like. Today we're going to look at this definition because to Paul, the new way to be human is taking full advantage of the power of God through Jesus Christ. If you want to truly be human, you need to understand that the new humanity is to embrace the fullness of the power of God through Jesus Christ. And so here we go, a couple of things. We're going to actually look at Galatians 5, 1 through 26. And if you're okay with it, we'll read the whole thing. Because I like just, just as it's a conversation, hearing what Paul is saying. But we're going to look at the characteristics of a new way to be human. So chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And he says, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, which if you've missed what we've talked about within the confines of circumcision, you can go back over the last couple of weeks and look into it. Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Anybody remember that term, fallen away from grace? It used to, t- we, 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 we actually kind of crossed it up with someone being apostate. Denying Christ, backsliding, you've fallen away from grace. Fallen away from grace is actually a resorting to embracing the wholeness of the law. Not necessarily walking away from God. Just pointing that out for just a second. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. That's important. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brother, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. I'm not going to get into that today, by the way. That's not a key verse to talk about. (laughs) Just saying, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That again, another important line. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. It's sad that Paul has to give an opportunity that if you bite and devour one another, here's the limit, don't be consumed. Wow. Almost like saying, I know you're going to do it, so just know the limit. What a shame. But I say, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's a great statement. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul gives a subtle rebuke. Somebody wants to watch the football. <laughs> Paul is giving a subtle rebuke here. It's not necessarily lighthearted. It's actually quite punchy. And essentially, though, we can break it down into two things that he has said to us. I'm going to break it down into two things that he has said to us today so that we understand the new way to be human. Number one, here's, here's the thing you've got to understand. The new way to be human, the first thing you do, embrace freedom. Embrace Freedom, not just not just say you like freedom, embrace it. It's a fact. It's a reality. Live in it. If you're going to embrace something, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, yeah, you know, freedom, it's good, but I really like bondage. You know, it's, you know freedom, that's a great notion. Freedom's not a notion when it's true. Freedom's not a notion when it's fact. And freedom is not a notion when there's evidence. And so we've got to understand this. When he says embrace freedom, he's really talking about living out the fullness of freedom in your life. Living out the fullness of freedom. So what do we look at? Jesus' purpose from Isaiah was to bring freedom to everyone that was captive. Didn't matter what that captivity was. Jesus' blood paid the price. It was the cost. Now, this is all in Galatians. You can read all of this. Jesus paid the price. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The reason you're free is for freedom. I mean, that's wonderful. That's, and that's the truth. The problem is, is that we don't live in that freedom. We don't embrace that freedom. Freedom's good when everything's good. Freedom's bad when we're struggling. Because then we look at people who are free and go, I, I, I really don't, I, we have nothing we can talk about. I, I can't relate to you. You can't relate to me. You're free. I'm not. Wait a minute. Same Jesus. How is it that the work of Jesus on the cross has freed me but not freed you? How is it that the work of Jesus on the cross has broken this struggle in my life, but not broken the struggle in yours. When it's the same Jesus, it's the same blood, it's the same cross, it's the same death, it's the same resurrection. There's not a single reality within, the, within Jesus that is different between me and you, except for what you embrace. And that's the difference. Freedom is what we stand on. Freedom is what we stand on. When temptation comes, we always go, oh, temptation, I'm being tempted. I must still be struggling in this area. No. It is your moment to stand on the fact that you're free. It is your moment to stand. That's what he says. You, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand. Like a matador. Like what's that dance that they, you know, uh, uh. Something, uh, so, I, I can't remember what it is. Well, so you think you can dance, it's that dance of manhood. The pasa doble, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's that man dance. Stand firm and puff your chest out and know who you are. You are free. When temptation comes your direction, you are free. I'm not a victim. I don't have to be victimized by this. I'm free. Do you see shackles? If you don't see shackles, stop trying to put them on yourself. Stop trying. It's an assurance of who you are, not who you will be. When Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. 
when you embrace the finished work of Jesus, it's finished. Yes, you are catching up to that reality, but that reality is not diminished because you're catching up to it. It's the fact. So we've got to we, we've got to be okay. Listen, yes, you are going to walk through a journey of freedom, but that but what you need to remember is that freedom was at the beginning and freedom is at the end. Yes. You're just working freedom in between the two places of freedom. I hope somebody gets that. The freedom that Jesus provides is immediate and powerful and done without any additional cost. Without any additional cost. Oh my. Understand this. Freedom is not permission. If you're going to embrace freedom, freedom is not permission. Freedom doesn't grant you permission to do what freedom broke you from. I mean, I'm telling you, Paul has, has delivered a, a very punchy word here, an understanding for us. The question freedom raises is, if you've been made free, why would you purposely put binders back on? It's like being Otis on the Andy Griffith show. And only you older folk with me would know who Otis is from Andy Griffith. Otis is the town drunk, respectable during the day, drunkard at night and would constantly walk himself to jail and put himself in prison every time he got drunk. Because apparently he knew he deserved prison. You see, this is the problem. When you aren't walking in freedom, you are constantly putting yourself in prison, feeling the guilt and the shame not of the activity, because if grace truly sets you free, the activity would bum you out. You don't like having to put yourself in prison, and you feel guilty about imprisoning yourself. You don't feel guilty about the action that puts you in prison. You feel guilty about prison, which means you have not fully embraced the work of freedom in your life. Nobody likes this. This is a hard word. You mean I have no excuse for my struggle? Yes, you do, and no, you don't. Sure, we're all fa- we all fall. We are all in that place of still stealing with the fallenness of our nature until Jesus comes and we are renewed and translated fully from one body into the next. We're going to struggle with these, with, with these moments where sin comes at us, where there's an opportunity and all of those things. But folks, freedom. Freedom has released me from having to dodge the punches because I have the shield of faith I'm blocking the dart I'm blocking the attack every time it comes at me love is the expression of freedom okay well now here's where we start talking to all the church people because see it's good to talk about sin and salvation and grace and mercy and and we all hoot and holler and we'll talk about the Holy Ghost and whoa Holy Ghost, there's, oh, we're a Pentecostal church, aren't we? Holy Ghost, that's fun. But when you start talking about love, then you start stepping on toes because you know that love being the expression of freedom means that the church that doesn't express love is not walking in the freedom that Christ has given us. And if we're not walking in the, lo- the freedom that Christ has given us and there is no love in this house, this can't be God's house. That's a strong word. Four times in John's gospel from 13 to, uh, and 15, Jesus gave the instruction and the evidence of followership, love one another. Faith, he says it, faith works by love. Through love, serve one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the opposite of love is the working of the flesh. What? Yeah. When you're not operating in the reality of love, you're embracing the work of the flesh. Paul said this, not pastor, Paul. This is where he makes the rubber meet the road. This is where he starts talking to the church folk. Now listen, love does not mean tolerance. No, Jesus died. 
That was the extent of his tolerance. And his death brings change. Takes you from where you were or are and moves you into where you can be and will be. It does not allow you to stay in a condition. But that does not mean that our door is closed to those who haven't transitioned yet. If they're going to use it, I'm going to use it. The world wants to use transition and they want it to mean one thing. Transition is the only thing that will keep you out of hell. And so we've got to embrace that thought process. How do you know when someone is operating in the flesh? It's recognizable when selfishness is present. Selfishness becomes the breeding ground for hurt, pain, bitterness, malice, wrath, anger, you name it. It's the breeding ground for it. We put it away because it is the opposite of love. Why do you put it away? Because it's the opposite of love. It's the opposite of love. So listen, if you want to go to a church where everybody's selfish, I don't want to go to church with you. Go find yourself a first church of selfishness down the road somewhere. Because the expression needs to be love. The expression needs to be love. That means, guess what? When someone comes in that's in a struggle that makes your skin crawl, you should be the first one up to the door to hug them and let them know that they are welcome in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, you can change. When somebody comes in with a drunken stupor, you should be the first one to bring them a cup of water. Bring them something. Sit down with them. Oh, and I'm not going to name all of the other little petty sins that everybody has their pet for. Oh, you know, I can love you through this, 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 and this, but you cross a line when you do this. I'm just saying, Smith Wigglesworth wasn't born an evangelist who was throwing people up against the wall that were dead to bring healing to him. He was an absolute wretch before he ever got saved. So he had an ability to speak to people because they saw the wretch he was and the man he became. You look at any of the heroes of faith and there was always a transition that took place in them. Some later than others. There was a transition that took place, a change that took place. The only thing the world knew about Paul was that he was going from town to town, hanging Christians, throwing them in prison, killing them off, doing the Lord's work. That's the only thing they knew. But in a moment of transition, transfiguration, all of that, in the moment he began to embrace freedom, they now knew that he who once persecuted the church is now preaching the gospel everywhere he goes. The, tr the, the change that took place in that man. And we are to be the atmosphere for that change to be acceptable. Now listen, spiritual change does not transform figure, fi, uh, excuse me, physical situation. But it will change your attitude in that physical situation. It will change you. It will change the way you respond to that situation. And it will eventually pull you up out of that situation. Well, let's be honest about it. Love becomes the key for our second evidence of the new way to be human. Love, if love is at the foundation of all of this, the second key evidence for us, what's the new way to be human? And now I'm going to talk to you Pentecostals for just a moment. Because the second key is very simple. Keep in step with the Spirit of God. Keep in step with the Spirit. Can I be honest and tell you that the Bible presumes... Spirit filled. There's not a letter written in scripture that wasn't to a spirit filled audience. Prove me wrong. <laughs> I'm just.
just saying. Paul was writing to people of expe- that, that he expected there to be uh, uh, significant evidence, not just of the Spirit's moving in the service, but the baptism, the wholeness of the Spirit of God in that individual person's life. So when he writes, he's not writing corporately to keep in step with the, with the Spirit. He's saying singularly keep in step with the Spirit so that corporately the Spirit is completely fully engaged when you get together. Keep in step with the Spirit. And the difference between the flesh and the Spirit is connected by Paul to the works of the law and therefore knowledge of sin and the gifts of the Spirit and therefore the operation of love. See, the gifts don't work if love's not present. Look, if I don't like you, I can definitely give you a word that reads your mail, especially if I know what it is. But that doesn't mean that it's God. That means that I have just aired your dirty laundry to the entire church. That's not love. That's not love at all. That's ridiculous. But the fact is, here's, here's, here's what he says. He makes this contrast. He says, keep in step with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The, he makes this difference, this differentiation, and he connects it to being law-abiding versus grace-walking. You see, as long as you are abiding by the law, you have nothing but the knowledge of sin. And the knowledge of sin drives you to sin, which means that the works of the flesh and therefore the evidence of the law in your life is the activity of sin. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's, that's hard to swallow, but it's true. That means every time we give in, We separate ourselves from Christ. Every time we give in to that sin, every time we make make mention of that sin, we're abiding by law and not freedom. That doesn't mean that you downplay the the, the significance of of folly. That, That doesn't mean that you downplay the fall. But what it means is that you upplay the grace. All right, you... All right, Romans says it this way, where sin abounds, grace did abound all the more. That means that when we see someone caught in a fall, we shower them with grace. Not pet. Right, right, right. Listen, I don't know about you, grace, pet me the first time I got saved. Oh, buddy, I love you, welcome in. And every time that since then, the experience with grace has been, I told you not to do that. Haven't I taught you to say no to this? Don't you know better? Yes, I do. Okay, all right. Well, as long as you know better. No. Hey, get up and let's walk better together. Because that's what grace is supposed to do. So it's this, this difference. He makes this difference. It's so powerful. His spirit and his fruits are nestled in the love of God. I mean, seriously, look at this. Look what he says as he contrasts. Verse 19. I don't know if you can go back to it, Chris, or not. Now the works of the flesh, as he's connected to the law, the works of the flesh are evident. Evident. You can see it. You can taste it. Touch it. Experience it. The senses let you know it's there. It's evident. And these are it. Sexual immorality. Listen, an over-sexualized community was even in the Bible. We're not foreign to an over-sexualized community. We see it now. It was going on then. Not just that. Impurity. And then sensuality. Wait a minute. Those, those all seem like the same thing. But for whatever reason, Paul has made them different. Idolatry. Well, can we say that idolatry is around? Listen, go Rangers. But if they get more praise than God does, you found an idol. When your life takes precedent over relationship with God, you found yourself an idol. When the Cowboys winning or losing messes or embraces or, or makes joyful your Saturday or your, well, for me it's OU and I was not upset, but I was upset. But y'all know what I'm talking about, sport to sport, you know. But when the Cowboys ruin your Sunday afternoon, 
when you spent two hours in the presence of God, in the freedom of God, and you have embraced the presence of God, and God moved in your life, and the word came across, and it encouraged you, and it was wonderful, and you sat at the dinner table, and all you could talk about was point A, or point B, or point C, or the extra point, or the conclusion, or whatever it is you were talking about, and how God just transformed your way of thinking in something, and then you sit down for three hours, and the cowboys take all of that away, that's an idol. Because an idol is anything that stands in for your relationship with God. And I know I use sports because I love sports. But it can be anything. It can be anything. Guess what? It can be ministry. I'll never forget, and, and, and a, a friend of ours used to talk about it all the time, but I'll never forget the one time that this this preacher who has now passed away and gone on to glory he was standing up on a stage and he says quit committing adultery with the bride of Christ and I had to stop for a second what you talking about he said that's the bride of Jesus he can take care of her if you're not taking care of yours you're in idolatry I'm going to tell you, ministry can be an idol, uh, an idol. Work can be an idol. Play can be an idol. Anything can be an idol. It doesn't just have to be one of those crazy gods that are mentioned in the Old Testament. Anything can be an idol because it's man-made. And it's man putting something in between. And yet at the same time, look what he continues to say. The works of the flesh. Sorcery. What? Wait a minute. Sorcery. So the Galatians were involved in incantations? They were engaged in it? What? Enmity. Okay, now we get into where the church is. We're going we gonna, we gonna to read your mail. Enmity. Strife. Now listen to that. Strife. Bitter division between people. He said, she said. Between people. You stepped on my toe, so I stepped on your foot. In between people. You have hurt my feelings to no end, and it has sunk down, and it is a seed in my heart, and it has been watered by the rage that's in my mind, and all of a sudden it's producing a tree. But I love Jesus. Shut up. No, you don't. You need deliverance, you need freedom. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I forgot the kids were in here. <laughs> Father, forgive me. Bless the pygmies in New Guinea. All right. Y'all know, okay, I'm just messing with you. All right. Take a joke, okay, people? Take a joke. So It's like he's so not serious when he should be. But think about it. Jealousy. How many times do we get so jealous because somebody had a touch from God and you stood right next to him? Looks like God did all kinds of deliverance in their life, but you stood right next to him and all you felt was the breath of the preacher. How is it that they got free and I didn't? I hate them. I'm not sure if God's real. How can he touch them and not touch me? Fits of anger. Fits of anger are fleshly. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says be angry and don't sin. But a fit is a problem. When you're given to explosion, listen, I don't care if you're like, well, I just let it build up, build up, build up, build up, build up till it blows over. No. Sin. Deal with it. What hurts you that made you so angry that you actually have something that festers and then you still let that splinter stay inside of you and fester again and fester again and fester again and fester again? Oh, well, you know, it's just me. Sometimes I get angry. No, you don't. You need freedom because obviously you haven't experienced it. Rivalries. Daniel's a better preacher than pastor. 
I only come when so-and-so is here. I'm on team this. I'm on team Jesus. Every other team needs to pale. Dissensions, divisions, envy. Then it gets back into what we would call worldliness, and yet it's in the church. Drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul didn't have enough words to express all the individual things, so he lumps it all into, and things like these. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be honest with you. This stuff that Paul just mentioned is evidence of sin and life and, separ- and law and separation from God. It's not just your hang up. It's separation. But the fruit of the spirit. Isn't it funny how he says, but the fruit of the spirit. He doesn't say it's evidence. Because it's evidence is changing you and changing everyone else. Because it's fruit. Fruit is made for picking and eating. And notice, it doesn't say that, you, that, that we produce different kinds of fruit. We all produce the same fruit. We all produce the same fruit. So any one of you should be ripe for the picking. But the fruit of the Spirit is first, it's love. Then it's joy. Well, if Joel doesn't pick some songs that make me happy. I don't know. uh, Why are you walking around with the bitter beer face today? I just have no joy. Why not? Jesus set you free. Peace. Patience. Patience. Long suffering. <laughs> what? Kindness, goodness, all oh, those are nice. We, we like those. We can be kind. We can be good. Faithfulness. Don't throw God under the bus. Gentleness, self-control, against such things, there is no law which identifies separation from God. You want to look close to God? Fruit is what you show. You want to look distant from God? Work is what you will show. Simply put. That's the way it looks. The spirit-filled life leaves no room for conceit, provocation, or envy. It leaves no room for this stuff. Can I be honest? This is Paul. Now, this is Paul, not just pastor. I'm messing because, it's the thing, because of things that you see. Pastors get to meddle, and they get to say, hey, Paul said it first. But if you look at Paul like a preacher who knows the business of the people of the church that he was ministering to, then we're kind of the same. But Paul says this very eloquently, sternly. Church is supposed to be different. It's supposed to be better. It's supposed to draw those who aren't in the church to want to be a part of the church because we love each other. Because we aren't competing with one another. Because we don't have envy. Because we're not provoking one another. Because we're not mad at each other. And if we do get upset with each other, we come to the altar together and we fix it under the same risen Christ who rose from the grave for both of us and saved us both. Anytime there's a difference, we bring it to the foot of the cross. Anytime there's a a strife or a struggle, we get it fixed very quickly. Why? Because the one thing we can't afford in the church is for there to be so much division. Ladies and gentlemen... How much division is in the church? More than we want to talk about. Why? Because we let the old way of being human determine our response instead of the new way of being human. So the new way to be human, I close, is absolutely grounded in the life of Christ 
living in and through me because I have died. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm dead. But he lives in me. I'm dead, church. When you look at me, Jason's death took place the day he said Jesus Christ is Lord. I died that day. Me, what makes me me. I died that day. You died the day you said Jesus Christ is Lord. And you transitioned, you transformed, you changed that very same day that you asked Jesus not just to be Lord of your life, but to sit upon the throne of your heart to take dominion over you. And when he did that, that became kingdom. And that became life. And, and we're going to, well, you know, we're going to close out this series. We're going to see how Paul determines the new way to be human, how it looks in daily life and relationship. That's next week. We'll look at that. But it all comes down to this. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He makes intercession for you continuously. If you are in Christ, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. This is all from Paul. This is the sentiment of Paul, ladies and gentlemen. And this is the instruction he gives us. Embrace freedom. Keep in step with the Spirit. It's the new way to be human. It's the kingdom's drip. The one who said that to me knows that I love them. And I thank them for allowing me to uh, use this as an illustration. But it is. It is the new way to be human. Stand with me this morning.